Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Knows. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into a time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Comedy and crime drama this hour with Lum and Abner, yours truly Johnny Dollar, and the Screen Directors Playhouse and Fred McMurray. Thank you so much for tuning in on this Saturday. Uh, This is the 23rd day of September, uh, the uh, day of the autumnal equinox in the Northern Hemisphere, the day of the vernal equinox in the Southern Hemisphere, first day of autumn up here in the North, and... uh, the first day of spring down south. A 266th day of the year, 99 days remaining till we get to 2024. In the American Revolution on this date in 1780, British Major John Andre arrested as a spy by American soldiers exposing Benedict Arnold's treason. In 1806, Lewis and Clark returned to St. Louis after exploring the Pacific Northwest. In 1846, the discovery of Neptune by French astronomer Urbain Jean Joseph Lavier and British astronomer John Couch Adams, and it was verified by German astronomer. Astronomer Johann Gottfried Gabe. In 1884, Hermann Hollerith patented the mechanical tabulating machine. In 1942, the first day of the September Manigau action on Guadalcanal as Marines forced atta- forces attacked Imperial Japanese Army units along the Manigau River. In 1944, President Roosevelt opened the presidential campaign speaking at a dinner with the International Teamsters Union in Washington and made a star of a companion of his. These Republican leaders have not been content with attacks on me or on my wife or on my son. No. Not content with that. They now include my little dog, (laughs) Fallon. Well, of course, I don't resent attacks. And my family don't resent attacks. But Fallon does resent (laughs) attacks. That speech, part of the reason why uh, this today, Saturday, the 23rd day of September, is recognized as National Dogs in Politics Day. The joke suggested by Orson Welles. The speech broadcast nationwide and is credited with FDR winning his fourth term. Now, the second reason that this is National Dogs in Politics Day is that on this date in 1952, Facing serious opposition within his own party, then-Vice President uh, presidential candidate Richard Nixon went on national television in the fight for his political life against a backdrop of allegations, making the speech about checkers. I own a 1950 Oldsmobile car. We have our furniture. We have no stocks and bonds of any type. We did get something, a gift. It was a little cocker spaniel dog, black and white, spotted. And our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Checkers. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. Liar and write the Republican National Committee, whether you think I should stay on or whether I should get off. I'm going to continue this fight. I'm going to campaign up and down in America until we drive the crooks and the communists and those that defend them out of Washington. Time for this program has now elapsed. Nixon at the time, the senator from California, had been accused of improprieties relating to a fund established by his backers to reimburse him for his political expenses. His place in doubt on the Republican ticket, he flew to Los Angeles and delivered that live half-hour television address. He defended himself, attacked his opponents, and urged the audience, as you heard there before he was cut off, to contact the Republican National Committee to tell it whether he should remain on the ticket. Ticket. And, um, uh, you know, one of the things is that Nixon came from a family of modest means, as he related in the address. 
The press became aware of the fund in September of 1952, two months after Nixon's selection as uh, General Eisenhower's running mate. The story quickly grew until it threatened his place on the ticket. So there you go. He made that. uh, The Republican National Committee raised the $75,000 to buy the television time, uh, which at that point in time was a lot of money. Today, it would be over $860,000, and you could probably buy a half hour of television time today for that uh, on a reasonable network, uh, just because, you know, you you couldn't buy it during the Super Bowl, uh, but you could probably buy it. Uh, The checkers speech and the other part of uh, National Dogs and Politics Day, that took place in 1952. Ten years later... Another dog premiering, this one on the boob tube, part of the family of the Jetsons. George O'Hanlon portraying uh, George from the series premiere until his death in 1989. Penny Singleton was Jane Jetson, as she had been uh, comic strip wife Blondie on radio and on the silver screen. Classic voice actors Dawes Butler and Janet Waldo playing playing children Elroy Roy and Judy. Uh, Interestingly enough, only 75 programs produced, 24 for their initial primetime run, then another 51 between 1985 and 1987. Uh, So few episodes, and yet, we watched them every time. 2002, the first public version of the web browser Mozilla Firefox released. In 2011, the soap opera All My Children broadcast its final episode on ABC, ending a 41-year run. In 2019, the British travel company Thomas Cook Group declared bankruptcy, leaving employees without jobs and 600,000 customers stranded abroad. Hotels throughout the world stuck with $4.3 million in unpaid bills. Passing away on this date in history, a number of notables, including Sigmund Freud, Cliff Arquette, Charlie Weaver, and Joanna on Newhart. Mary Fran. Among birthdays on this date, we have uh, actor Walter Pigeon, also actor Mickey Rooney, musician Ray Charles, Ebb on Green Acres, Tom Lester, and actress Michelle Thomas. Uh, turning 80 years old today, Julio Iglesias, to all the girls I loved before. Uh, let's see, Jeff Stone on the Donna Reed Show. Uh, the son, Paul Peterson, 78 years old today. Mary Hartman star, Mary Kay Place. No, I know she didn't play uh, Mary Hartman, but uh, her role in the show was significant. Uh, Rosalind Chow, she was Klinger's wife on MASH. Kiko O'Brien, the wife of Miles O'Brien in Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. Rosalind Chow, 66 today. From Seinfeld, Jason Alexander, 64. Pro wrestler Matt Hardy, wonderful, uh, is 49 today, and we will not delete him for a long time, we hope. And turning 74 today, Bruce Springsteen. In, uh, in 75, we went into the studio to make Born to Run. I wanted to make a record with words like Bob Dylan that sounded like Phil Spector, but most of all, I wanted to sing like Roy Orbison. May not agree with his politics, but he sure did produce some good music. Bruce Springsteen, 74 years old today. Those just a few of the people who celebrate the 23rd day of September as their birthday. And if this happens to be your birthday... Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you! 
And we'll start off this edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox with an episode of the Screen Director's Playhouse from 74 years ago, Don't Trust Your Husband, starring Fred McMurray. That's up next here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. If your youngster's heading back to school, why not give them the gift of a good night's sleep? That'll help them study better and should help their grades. Uh, MyPillow.com. The MyPillow Limited Edition 20th Anniversary Pillows. As low as $19.98 for the queen size pillow, $10 more for the king size. They also have sheets, towels, comforters, bathrobes, everything a youngster should need to get a good night's rest. And then when they get up, they got something to throw on to go get a shower. Uh, MyPillow.com, promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. That's 1-800-928-4715. Get your youngster off to school with a new set of MyPillow sheets and uh, uh, MyPillows and pillowcases and the whole nine yards. MyPillow.com, promo code Wyatt. Now, let's get to comedy, an episode of the Screen Director's Playhouse. This goes back 74 years. Uh, Fred McMurray starred in the 1948 uh, excuse me, motion picture comedy and uh, reprised his role in this episode of the Screen Director's Playhouse from 74 years ago, uh, Don't Trust Your Husband. Oh, uh, waiter. Yes, sir? I'll have Yankee pot roast, some mashed potatoes, a mixed green salad with French dressing... And a bottle of cold Pabst Blue Ribbon. Yes, sir. Finest beer served anywhere. From Hollywood, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Proudly presents... Screen Director's Playhouse... Production, Don't Trust Your Husband. Director, Lloyd Bacon. Star, Fred McMurray. The Hollywood Screen Directors present an interlude of laughter. The motion picture comedy... Don't Trust Your Husband, starring Fred McMurray and introduced by the director of the film, Lloyd Bacon. One of the facts of picture making is that a camera is a machine that sees what the director wants it to see. And if the machine can capture a whole world of entertainment, much of the credit belongs to such pioneer directors as our guest tonight. The creator of such grand films as Mother is a Freshman, You Were Meant for Me, and of course, Don't Trust Your Husband. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lloyd Bacon. Thank you. And you probably guessed from the title of our story, it doesn't try to solve any pressing world problems, but it might help you forget a few of them. As we turn to the particular brand of nonsense that made this picture so much fun to do. Now here it is for the first time in the air, starring Fred McMurray in his original role of Vince Doan in Don't Trust Your Husband. The title of our story does not necessarily reflect this program's views on marriage. However, if you happen to be the wife of an advertising executive who spends his evenings with a mysterious client named Mr. Frazier, we advise you to listen closely, especially if you should wake up at six o'clock some morning and find your husband in evening clothes tiptoeing into the bedroom. Oh, oh, uh, um, good morning, Paula. I'm, uh, I'm sorry if the, uh, the alarm woke you up. Alarm? 
I didn't hear it. Well, you, uh, you must have been sleeping. I, uh, I just turned it off. Oh. Uh, I thought you said you turned it off. Well, it uh, must be an echo. <laughs> what are you doing in your clothes at six o'clock? Uh, well, I, uh, I've got a date with Mr. Fraser to, uh, to play golf. In your tuxedo? Well, I, uh, I like to be neat. <laughs> what time did you get in? Oh, it was only... Uh, what time did you fall asleep, dear? About 1.30. Well, that's just about the time I got in. <laughs> uh, Mr. Fraser wouldn't let me get away any earlier. Did he sign the contract? No, not yet, but he will. Vince, hmm? were you really with Mr. Fraser? Why, Paula, what a question. Certainly I was with her. I mean, I mean him. I see. Yes, well, uh, dear, we're teeing off at seven. Goodbye. Paula, I was just thinking, uh, I've been so busy lately, maybe we should take a night off for ourselves, go somewhere. Huh? That would be very nice. Tonight, huh? You pick the spot. Darling. Uh-huh. I wouldn't want to call you a liar, so you just run along to your golf game. <laughs> yes, dear. But I'd like to break a niblick over your head. Well, that's very bad form, Paula. The rule book calls for a mashy shot. <laughs> Oh, Vince. Yes, dear? You can tell Mr. Frazier I don't like his brand of face powder. It keeps coming off on your lapels. Oh. Oh. But, Paula, I can't tell him that. He might think I'm being catty. <laughs> well, uh, goodbye, dear. Oh, darn. Vince, what's happening to us? Hi. Don't you believe in letting a sister-in-law sleep these mornings? Oh, hello, Eve. What's all the commotion? It's your brother. I think he's turning into a fiend. Or maybe you're just feeding him too much meat. <laughs> Honestly, Eve, I don't think there really is a Mr. Frazier. Well, who's he spending all his time with? That's what I'd like to find out. The way he comes in at dawn every morning. Maybe he's playing pinochle with the milkman. No, I'm serious, Eve. And I'm worried. You know, it's just too bad you can't worry him for a while. I bet Vince wouldn't even be jealous of me anymore. No, not unless you give him something to be jealous about. And you couldn't... You couldn't... Paula! You could. How? The Ted Burke Talent Agency. They handle all kinds of actors. Now, why couldn't you do this? Right after breakfast, we'll go downtown to hire a fella to... Miss Nelson. Yes, Mr. Doan. Uh, take an inter-office memo. Yes, Mr. Doan. To the president of Hendricks, Benton, Dorton, and Durr Advertising Agency. Dear Mr. Hendricks, I quit. Sign it for me and go hit Mr. Hendricks across the mouth with it. Vince, my boy. Uh, Mr. Hendricks, I've got news for you. Uh, that'll be all, Miss Nelson. Did Margot Fraser sign the contract? No, but she's breaking up my marriage. The company can have the usual 15% commission. Vince, why didn't you tell your wife that the president of Maidam Cosmetics is a woman? Why? Because Margot and I used to be engaged, that's why. You know how wives are about things like that. Paula finds out I'm spending all this time with her, she'll never forgive me. I'm sorry, T.D., but I can't go through with it. I'm quitting. You can't do that. You're the only one Margot Fraser will talk business with. Business? All she wants to do is neck. <laughs> how long can I fight her off? Well, look, look, Don. Now, how would you like to be a partner in the business? Hendricks, Fenton, Dorton, Durr, and Doan. Now, how does that sound to you? Well... Say it again, will you? Henry Fenton, Dorton, Durton, and uh, Doan. Oh. <laughs> Sounds kind of fuzzy, doesn't it? Now, look, there's a big bonus, Vince. Stay on the job, get that contract, and you're in. All right, Mr. Hicks. All right, I'll try. Fine, my boy, fine. Mr. Doan, there's a Mr. Ted Burke here to see you. No, uh, send him in, Miss Nelson. Mr. Doan, I'm Ted Burke of the Burke Talent Agency. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry, Burke. We're not auditioning right now. Oh, well, maybe you can throw a little business my way if I uh, do you a favor. Favor? Yeah, this morning a dame came into my office and she wants to hire a guy to make a play for. You know, right in front of her husband. Make him jealous. Oh. Well, uh, what's that got to do with me? You're the husband. <laughs> what? Yeah, I thought you'd like to know. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, uh, it's, it's, of course, it's just a little joke. Uh, great little kidder, my wife. <laughs> yeah, with a sense of humor like that, it's a miracle you ain't in the hospital. <laughs> As, uh, tell me, Burke, uh, where is all this going to happen? Oh, at the uh, Spartan Room tonight. Your wife says that you'll be sitting at table number four, so I reserve table number three for my client. Oh, <laughs> Well, uh, be sure to get a good-looking guy, you know, uh, someone I can really be jealous of. Yeah, well, that won't be hard. <laughs> uh, he'll, be, he'll be real class, you know, and probably pose as a big-shot businessman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see who's jealous. <laughs> Spartan Room, Captain's desk. Oh, hello, hello Julius. Uh, this is Ted Burke. Oh, yes, Mr. Burke. Julius, earlier today, I reserved table number three for one of my actor clients, but he's going to be delayed. Uh, can you hold the reservation? Oh, we are very busy, Mr. Burke, but I will try. Oh, I'll sure pre- appreciate it. Thanks, Julius. Uh, Captain. Oh, good evening, sir. You have a reservation? <laughs> well, I'm afraid not, but my company usually has a standing reservation. Your company, sir? Uh-huh, Kim Cigarettes. I'm Claude Kimball. Kim Cigarette. Oh, my apologies, Mr. Kimball. Of course we have a table for you. Table number three. The actor who reserved it is late. George, please show Mr. Kimball to number three, next to Mr. and Mrs. Dawn. Uh, yes, Paula? You see that man at the next table? Uh, yes, I know. He's, uh, he's been watching you. I think he winked at me. Well, uh, maybe he's just twitchy. Well, how can you sit there and let a strange man twitch at me? <laughs> Don't worry, I'll take care of him. Vincent, darling, you're jealous. Now, you just sit where you are, Paula. This is a matter between two male animals. <laughs> Hello, bub. Hello, uh- I'm afraid I don't know you. Look, uh, if you're going to make love to my wife, you'll have to do better than you're doing. But, sir, I assure you... I uh, saw you watching her. I, uh, I know just what you have in mind. Oh. Well, then, I apologize. <laughs> uh, come on over, right over to our table. Hmm? You don't have any objection? Oh, just don't take too long about making a play for her. Have to get up in the morning, you know, so uh, let's get this over with and get home early, huh? Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> Darling, this is uh, Mr... Uh, my name's Kimball. Yes, I'm Vince Doan, and this is my wife, Paula. How do you do? <laughs> now, uh, you just sit right here next to Paula. Uh-huh. Here, hold my hand. Eh, uh, what? Shh. <laughs> Don't argue. You can kiss me later. <laughs> Man, this sure beats southern hospitality. <laughs> Well, uh, Mr. Kimball, uh, what business are you in? Uh, the tobacco business. Oh, tobacco business. Uh-huh. Uh, not any relation to Claude Kimball, the tobacco tycoon, by any chance. Uh, well, I'm Claude Kimball. You're, <laughs> You're Claude Kimball. Uh-huh. You don't tell me. <laughs> well, uh, Claude, I happen to be in the advertising business. Uh, Hendrix, Fenton, Dorton, and Dewey, you've heard of them. Uh, maybe someday we could handle your account. Eh? Well, maybe you could, Ben. <laughs> Claude, put your arm around me. Huh? Put your arm. There. Oh, uh, Vince, your wife I hope you don't mind <laughs> Oh, no, not at all, not at all, uh, Claude uh, Have a good time, that's what we're here for <laughs> Can't you be a little more ardent? Yeah, but your husband What are you, an amateur or something? Oh, I've been around <laughs> Act like it Well, you too, I, uh, I hate to break this up But it's getting a little late Oh Vince, Claude and I were just beginning to enjoy each other's company. Well, then, uh, how about getting together tomorrow? The three of us? Oh, no, no, I'm going to be busy, but uh, why don't you two make a day of it, huh? Vince! Go on, have have fun. Well, I'm willing. (laughs) And so am I. Uh, Vince, old man, I'm going to think about that Kim cigarette account for your company. Oh, sure, 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 Claude. Uh, You do that. (laughs) Good night, Claude. Until tomorrow, Paula. Uh, If you have any friends that you think would like my wife, just bring them around. (laughs) Well, if you don't mind, I think I'll keep her just to myself. Vincent, after all, you are my husband. But I trust you, dear. And you trust me. (laughs) And if we trust each other, there's nothing to worry about. Is there? (laughs) 
Good morning, Miss Nelson. Oh, Mr. Doan, and Mr. Kimball has been phoning you all morning. Kimball? Oh, oh yes, Kimball, a great little actor, that guy. Uh, Mr. Hendricks is waiting in your office. Uh, thanks, Miss Nelson. Well, good morning, boss. Congratulations, my boy. From this minute, you're a partner in this business. Partner? But I haven't landed the Margot Fraser account yet. I'm talking about the Kim cigarette account. Called Kimball from this morning. He... He did? He said he's giving all his business to us and to credit you with the account. Kimball? Claude Kimball? Are you sure? Well, yes, I'm sure. Uh, uh, what's the matter, boy? You look sick. Uh, something inside of me just died. <laughs> well, tell me, how did you get to know Kimball anyway? Uh... Through my wife, I guess. Well, I didn't know you were in so solid with him. I, I didn't know it myself. He says he considers you a close friend. He does. And your wife even closer. <laughs> Mr. Hendricks, do you know what a man says when he's just put his wife on a silver platter and handed her to somebody else? What? Listening to the Screen Directors Playhouse production of Don't Trust Your Husband, starring Fred McMurray, and introduced by the director of the film, Lloyd Bacon. You are at Elkhart, Indiana. The train has just pulled out. You, hot, tired, and bored from your long journey, stoop over to pick up your suitcase and sample kit. There must be some place in this town where a man can get a tall, cooling glass of Pabst Blue Ribbon. In the gathering dusk, you search among the neon signs. Ah, there you are. Just across the street, that little blue sign. Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served. Anywhere. Yes, during these late September days, you're just one of millions of men all over America to whom that Pabst Blue Ribbon sign means welcome relief. For Pabst Blue Ribbon does something more than quench your thirst. It gives you taste. Blue Ribbon taste. The kind of taste you can't get anywhere else in the world except in that Pabst Blue Ribbon bottle. And, fortunately, you can get that Pabst Blue Ribbon bottle all over the world. Yes, you hear it everywhere. In Elkhart and Elmira and Easton or Evanston. Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served. Anywhere. Your taste will tell you why. Now, back to the Screen Director's Playhouse production of Don't Trust Your Husband, starring Fred McMurray. Paula, where are you? Hey, Vince, what are you doing home so early? Oh, hello, Eve. Where is she? Where's my wife? Oh, she's with Claude Kimball. But he isn't an actor. He's real. A real man is out with my wife. <laughs> well, really, Vince, there just isn't any reliable substitute. <laughs> Besides, how do you know about the actor? Well, never mind about that. This Kimball guy means business. Oh, you're telling me. We found out this morning. But Paula can't go running around with another man. Well, why not? Because, well... Well, that's the stupidest question I ever heard of. He certainly is handsome, isn't the he? The nerve of that Mississippi moose. And he's rich, too. Will you stop praising him and act like a sister? Well, why don't you act like a husband? For your information, I never felt more like a husband in my life. Good. And maybe you can forget your Mr. Fraser. Fraser? Fraser? Good, good Lord, I did forget. We've got a date for lunch. Well, you're my brother, brother. So take it from little Eve. You better stop playing around or you're going to lose Paula. And I'll find some way to get, get even with that tobacco Romeo. How? Well, I'll... I'll... I'll stop smoking cigarettes. <laughs> Margaret, the contract's all drawn up. All you have to do is sign. Vince, darling, I don't want to sign. Not yet, anyway. But you're wrecking my marriage. Stop foaming and eat your lunch. I don't want to eat. <sighs> 
Then tell me about my eyes. You used to adore my eyes. Margo, that was five years ago. Oh. I happen to be in love with my wife. And I'm going to lose her to another man because she thinks that you're a woman. Want to make some bets? <laughs> she happens to... Oh, oh. Vince, what is it? Over there, Paula and Kimball. I'm a dead duck. Hello, Vince. Hey, they're coming over. Oh, death, where is thy sting? You heal. There it is now. Paula, uh, darling, uh, this is Mr. Fraser. Uh, Howdy, ma'am. <laughs> you bluebeard. Oh, now, Paula, just because I didn't shave this morning. So this is the Mr. Fraser you've been carrying on with. <laughs> Oh, Vince, how could you? Well, there now, Paula, don't you cry, little sugar foot. <laughs> Mr. Kimball, would you please take your arm away from little sugar foot's waist? Listen, don't I want a divorce? I don't know, Paula, honey. Fool I didn't me a minute coming home at six in the morning Fraser, with Jane Goff. You and your daughter. I love you, I want Paula. a divorce, Vince, and a divorce, a divorce, a divorce. <laughs> A divorce, Eve. Paula wants a divorce. Well, can you blame her, Vince? But, Eve, I haven't done anything wrong. I, I'm completely innocent. Well, she's out in the living room with Claude. Now, my advice to you is to make one last attempt. Tell her the truth. But, Eve, I have been telling her the truth. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> my boy, there are two kinds of truth. The real truth and the woman's kind. Tell her the real truth and you're dead. Tell her the truth she's certain of and you've got nothing to worry about. Well, you really think she'd forgive me? Certainly. Well, what about that moldy mint julep out there, that Kimball guy? <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I kind of like him. How can you like a guy like that? You give him, give him an inch and he takes a mile. All I did was give him permission to make love to my wife and look what's happened. You better get out there and make up some story about Margot Frazier. All right. All right, Eve, here I go. Well, Vince, we were just talking about you. I was just remarking what an utter jerk you are, dear. Uh, well, well, maybe you're right, Paula. Paula, I've made a big mistake. I think so, too, Vince. Uh, Claude, I know this is very bold of me, but would you mind letting me have a few words alone with my wife? No, not at all. Thank you. You stay right here, Claude. <sighs> Paula, I want to tell you the truth about Margot and me. I want to be clean again. Margot and I, well, I've been a fool. I admit it. And I know you'll be big enough to forgive me. There. I feel as though I'd just taken a bath. I feel as if I'd like to hit you with a bathtub. But <laughs> I thought you'd be glad to hear the truth. Claude, hand me that base. Yes, ma'am. No, 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 Paula. I, I didn't mean it. There are two kinds of truth, Paula. Well, I... try this kind for size. No, no, Paula. That... Missed. Well, try this one. Oh, no, Paula, that's bigger than the other one. <laughs> what happened, then? What happened? Big help you are. She went wild when I told her. Oh, well, I never did know much about women myself. Now, you picked a fine time to let me know. Well, I'll go in there and see what I can do. Maybe I can convince her you are lying. Uh, and see if you can get that Alabama menace out of there. <laughs> well? Vincy boy. Margo. I thought I'd drop in for a minute. Well, drop right out again. My marriage is in the process of being retooled. <laughs> oh, Vincy. But I've been very unfair. I want to sign the contract. I don't care about the contract. You want to sign the contract? Yes, Vince. Well, just a minute. The contract. The contract. Oh, where's the contract? Oh, here it is. There. There you are, Michael. Just sign here. Uh -huh. Here's the pen. There you are, Vince. Oh, Margo, I could hug you. Uh, well, go ahead and hug. Oh, I will. <laughs> hey, not so hard. Vince, Eve just told me the... Vince! Paula... If somebody will hand me a gun, I'll just blow my brains out. <laughs> Miss Frazier, would you mind stepping out of my husband's arms while I talk to him? Vince, why don't you let me go? I don't know. I, I think I'm paralyzed. <laughs> For a minute, Vincent, Eve had me convinced. But to bring this woman into our own home... To display her openly like this. Oh, now, wait a minute. Vince told me what you two have been up to behind my back. What do you mean up to? I'll tell you exactly what he said. Uh, I'll if I'll you tell ladies will forgive me, I'll, 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 I'll see you later. Vincent, I want a word with you about your wife. Oh, no, are you still here? Listen, you sun-kissed Georgia Peach, I'm going to toss you out of here and your sun-kissed Ah, <laughs> uh, Vince. You stay out of this, Eve. What do you get off? I'm um, going uh, off carrying on with my wife anyway. Now, Vincent. But you said you didn't mind. That was because I thought you were getting paid for it. Oh, well, I couldn't accept money for a thing like that. <laughs> you 
get out of here. <laughs> Vince, I've been trying to tell you. Claude isn't interested in Paula. He, uh, he isn't? No. You see, Vince, I've been told that uh, Eve here is more my type. <laughs> yeah? Who told you? I did. <laughs> Well, just get this venomous Virginian out of the house. That's all I ask. Well, Vincent, don't. How dare you talk about him like that? Ow! Come on, Claude. Yes, little sugar foot. <laughs> Margo. Vince, I just had a little talk with your wife. Well? Well, this is for bragging. Ow! Goodbye. Paula. I just had a little talk with Margot Frazier. But, Paula... This is for lying. Ow! And this is for being such a wonderful... Oh, Paula, please, not again. Don't again. <clears throat> Paula, you kissed me. Yes? Mrs. Jones. I'm Mrs. Jones. I'm from the Ted Burke Agency. I had a hard time tracking you down, but here I am, ready to make love to you. <laughs> Uh, do you want me to start right away? <laughs> Pardon me, dear. And who are you, my good man? Uh, just an amateur. Uh, stick around and see what you can learn. <laughs> Paula, come here. Watch this, my good man. Vinny! Gee. <laughs> Golly. Wow. <laughs> just heard the last act of Don't Trust Your Husband. In a moment, our star, Fred McMurray, and screen director Lloyd Bacon will return to the microphone. The other day, a publicity writer said to me, Jimmy, what are you trying to do, wreck our business? All this talk you give out about Hollywood being a modest, home-loving town? <laughs> well, I'm only telling the truth. Most of the movie stars are just as normal as blueberry pie. Folks like you and me who enjoy such simple pleasures as sitting out in the backyard, playing gin rummy, cooking hot dogs over a fire, and drinking cold bottles of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Everything in perfect taste. Blue Ribbon taste. And it's that Blue Ribbon taste that has made this internationally famous beer so popular here in Hollywood and all over America. As a radio announcer, I have a fairly wide acquaintance among the movie people, and I've observed Pabst Blue Ribbon not only in the homes of the stars, but in the homes of movie writers, cameramen, directors, radio engineers, and, well, just about everybody I know. There seems to be unanimous agreement that Pabst Blue Ribbon is the finest beer served anywhere. Your taste will tell you why. Next week, Screen Director's Playhouse brings you a program in tribute to the late screen director, Mr. Sam Wood. Our story will be taken from one of his finest pictures, Pride of the Yankees, and our star will be Gary Cooper. Now, here again is tonight's star, Fred McMurray, and screen director, Lloyd Baker. Lloyd, uh, you've been in the movie business a long time. Tell me, uh, how did you get into the picture business in the first place? Well, Fred, <clears throat> years ago I was on the stage. And once I had a part in Oscar Wilde's play, Salome. Uh, good role, Lloyd? Well, Fred, for 450 nights I had my head chopped off. <laughs> <laughs> then I wanted the pictures. You thought you were ready, huh? Brother, with my experience, I could scream cut with the best directors in the business. Uh, Lloyd, uh, how about giving the audience a demonstration? Like this, Fred... Cut! <laughs> that means the end of the scene. Good night, Lloyd. Good night, Fred. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Fred McMurray and screen director Lloyd Baker. Friends, when you buy your weekend supply of beer tomorrow morning... Ask your dealer to show you Pabst Blue Ribbon's new Handy Six Carton with a cleverly designed new easy-to-carry handle. 
It contains six regular-sized cans of Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Ask for the Handy Six tomorrow. Don't Trust Your Husband was presented through the courtesy of James Nasser Productions, soon releasing Without Honor, starring Lorraine Day and Dana Clark. Fred McMurray will soon be seen in Borderline, co-starring with Claire Trevor. Lloyd Bacon is the director of the soon-to-be-released Columbia Pictures production, Miss Grant Takes Richmond, starring Lucille Ball and William Holden. Included in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg as Paula, Mary Shipp, Betty Lou Gerson, Jack Edwards, Jay Novello, Hal Gerard, Betty Moran, Herb Vigran, and Don Stanley. Don't Trust Your Husband was adapted for radio by Richard Allen Simmons. And original music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley with dramatic direction by Bill Karn. Listen again next week when Pat Blue Ribbon presents... Screen Director's Playhouse, production, Pride of the Yankees, director, Sam Wood, star, Gary Cooper... Screen Director's Playhouse is brought to you by the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, New York, New Jersey, and Peoria, Illinois. And sent your way with the best wishes of the Pabst Blue Ribbon dealers from coast to coast. James Wallington speaking. From September 23rd, 1949, the Screen Director's Playhouse here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Up next, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, almost the end. Bob Bailey was not the first Johnny Dollar, but I think a lot of people believe he was the best. Of course, Edmund O'Brien and uh, John Lund played uh, Johnny Dollar before Bob Bailey took the, took the role. And uh, then after the show moved from Hollywood to New York, Bob Bailey was replaced first by uh, Bob Reddick. And then the final Johnny Dollar was the man you're going to hear today, Mandel Kramer. You're used to hearing him on Counter Spy. But for the last year or so, uh, Bob Bailey was, uh, or I should say, uh, Mandel Kramer played Johnny Dollar. And we're going to hear an episode today from September 23rd, 1962, 61 years ago. This is the next to the last episode. And you notice at the end, they say, make sure you listen next week. That was the last thing that was said about the show ending. He didn't say the show was ending, but he gave the implication. And uh, let's listen to this next to the last episode. It's a fun trip uh, from September 23rd, 1962, The Deadly Crystal Matter. Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Johnny, Les Walters at World Mutual. Les, how are you? Uh, I'm ready to blow a gasket. Why? What's the matter? Trouble. $300,000 worth. It's a lot of trouble. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll pick you up at your place in, say, uh, 20 minutes. All right, but what's it all about, Les? Murder, burglary, arson, embezzlement? Uh, I'll tell you when I see you. Well, give me a hint, at least. Some possible angle to mull over. All you have to mull over is what your commission may be on 300 Gs. Okay, I don't mind if I do. Yeah, uh, if you can solve this one. Uh, see you. I'll be there. <laughs> The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to World Mutual Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of... The Deadly Crystal Matter. By the time I'd shaved, showered, dressed, and poured myself a cup of coffee, Les Walters was pounding on my door. Coming, Les! Coming! 
And the top of the morning to you. Oh, well, you have to sound so all fired cheerful. <laughs> oh, why not? Come on in, join me a cup of coffee. No, 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 no time. Not if you're going to make the next plane to New York. Oh, I am. You are. Why? I told you. $300,000 the company doesn't want to have to pay out. For what? Look, will you quit stalling? Let's go. just came back from New York? Yes, yes. Or rather, uh, Bronxville, one of the suburbs. Yes, I know the town. Well, that's where Mrs. Gurney Dalrymple Weatherwell lives. And who is she? An eccentric old character, if ever was. Lives at 1263 Birch Brook Road. You got it? 1263 Birch, Birch Brook Road. I got it. Now, tell me, what's happened? Ah, the old, old caper. Servants, they are. The old lady all alone. With... 300,000 worth of jewels. You mean she kept that kind of stuff around the house? <laughs> she kept it on her. On her? Yeah. 24 hours a day, even when she went to bed. To a reminder of the old days when she didn't have a cent, she said. I told you she's a character. Boy, she must be. Yeah, well, the only time she didn't wear it was when she took a bath. So, what happened? She took a bath. <laughs> you may think you're kidding, but that's it. She left the stuff on a dressing table in her bedroom. By the time she got out of the tub, threw on a dressing gown, walked back into the bedroom, the stuff was gone. And absolutely no sign of where and how and by whom. Mm. The police have any ideas? Oh, she won't let them near the place. Why not? Look, I told you, Johnny, she's, she's a, a character. character, all right. Yes, she's a character. She, she wouldn't even give me any details beyond what I've told you. Insisted that you and you alone handle the case. Well, go for her. Now, here, here's a list of everything. Watch it, watch it, Len. It's close. Crazy woman driver. Uh, quite a doll, though. Almost yeah, be a pleasure to be run down yeah, by. Yeah, sure. Well, not me. <laughs> Anyhow, let's see. Here, here's the list. Now, the most valuable piece is that number one item there, a necklace with a big ruby pendant. You see it there? Wow. 23 carats. 23. I wouldn't let that out of my sight even when I took a shower. Yeah. Now, when did it happen, Les? Uh, you shouldn't have asked. Hmm? Two weeks ago today. What? Yeah. And she only just now notified you? Yeah, yeah. And she won't let the police take a hand, huh? No, I told you, John. Yes, you told me, Les, but if you ask me, there's something very, very fishy about all this. Item one, 1045, plane fare to New York. And aboard the plane, in the seat right next to me, yes, the girl who had nearly run us down on the way to the airport. She was late 20s, I'd say, very petite and cute, with jet black hair and warm brown eyes. Vaguely familiar, too, but not exactly sociable. I told you, Mr. What'd you say your name is? Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes. And yours? Lynn Peters, if it makes any difference. Well, of course it does, because Lynn is... Look, I, I told you, Johnny, it was completely the fault of whoever was driving your car. And that's that. Now, excuse me. I'll tell you what, Lynn, I'll have him send you a written apology, okay? It won't be necessary. Forget it. Now, if you'll excuse me. Forget that somebody as pretty as you are might have been hurt because of his... I said excuse me. I'd like to read, if you don't mind. Ouch. Item two in New York, $50 deposit on a rental car. An hour later, I pulled up in front of the old mansion at 1263 Birch Brook Road in the beautiful suburb of Bronxville. And Mrs. Gurney Dalrymple Weatherwell was a character. Mr. Walter told you rightly, Mr. Dollar. Like today, it was the servant's day off. I was completely alone here. And it was while I was taking my tub that my priceless jewelry was stolen. And, uh... No sign of anyone having broken in, Mrs. Weatherwell? None whatsoever. I see. Now, tell me, who else has a key to the house besides the servants? No one, and it was not they who did it. Well, can you be sure of that? Absolutely certain. I won't even permit your questioning them about it. Any family, then? Ever since my husband died, I've lived here entirely alone. Except for the servants. It was not they. You didn't really answer my question about family. There's someone at the door, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I know, but before you You may answer... answer it. What? I told you no servants today, so you will answer the door. Go on, young man, go on. All right, all right. 
Here, Charlie says you... Lynn! Oh. Uh, here, would you, would you take this blonde Oh, well, Wait a minute, Lynn. Who's Lynn? You are. At least that's the man... Well, what is it? What is it, young man? What is, what's that basket you have there? Is that for me? Yes, yes, it is. Here. Well, then, please shut that door. Well, now, just a minute. I, I think... If this is what I think it is. Now, wait a minute. The girl out there who brought it, would you just stand aside one moment, Don't please? bother, Mr. Dollar. You see? There they are, my jewels. What? Yeah, that's right, all of them. I knew Charles wouldn't think... Now, wait a minute. Listen to me. That girl... The only thing I'm interested in is that my jewels are back. Uh, see, aren't they lovely? Yes, they're lovely, but if you'll let me by, please, so I can see what happened Here. to her. While I hold it in place, you may close the catch on this necklace for me. Go on, fix it. Uh, okay, okay. There you are. Kill. You may go now. Thank you. Now that she's gone. I have my jewels back. The case is closed, and I have no further need of you. Goodbye. The case is closed, hmm? Yes. Please. That's what you think. I told Liz I thought there was something fishy about this case. Now I was sure of it. I was also sure there was no point trying to get anywhere with Mrs. Weatherwell. So, there wasn't much to go on, except the girl, Lynn Peters, if that really was her name. And there had been something vaguely familiar about her, but from where? I drove back to New York to 18th Precinct Police Headquarters with my old pal, Lieutenant Randy Singer. Lynn Peters. No, no, it doesn't ring a bell with me, Johnny. What have you got on her? Accessory to a jewelry heist up in Bronxville, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, what did the police think up there? Randy, they don't even know the stuff was taken. They don't. Mm-mm. And now that it's all been returned... Returned? By who? This girl, this Lynn Peters. But if the stuff is back, why worry about it? I want to know why it was brought back. And if it was intended to be returned, why it was stolen in the first place. So, the answer is to find the girl. Oh, wish I could help you, Johnny, but I never even heard of her. So how's about forgetting her and treating me to a nice dinner on that expense account of yours, huh? Randy, how about a look at your mug book, hmm? Book? We've got a stack of them this high, Johnny. It'll take you two weeks. Just lead me to them. But you're not even sure she's from here in New York. Randy, listen to me. More than any other city in the world, this town puts a kind of stamp on its people. Not just the way they talk, though New Yorkers do have a kind of a dialect all their own, but there's more than that. It's the way they walk, the way they dress. The way a girl uses makeup, the way she reacts when you try to make a pass at her. Oh, now I get it. Your real reason for wanting to find this dame... Oh, you... come on now. Stop. The fact remains that if somebody asked me, I'd say right off that she's a New Yorker. So let me see the mug books. But even if she is a local, she wouldn't be in one of them unless she's been on the plotter. And from what little you seem to know about her, from only the fact she happened to return some stolen goods, and without even a charge against her on this particular job, and with only your suspicion that she might be involved. Okay, Johnny, just follow me. And 15 minutes later, it was 4 a.m., and I was still poring over the mug books. Randy was back on duty and shoving a mug of hot coffee at me. Oh, come on, Johnny. Give up, will you? Nope. But even if you find her, you've got nothing on her. And from what you've told... All right. All right, so I'm stubborn. But until I figure out what this cockeyed caper is all about... But don't just stand there, Randy. Give me a hand. Me? I don't even know what she looks like. All right. She looks a little like this one, only the eyes are different. Mm. And a bit like this one, only she's smaller. Like this one here a little, only darker hair and much cuter. Cuter. Ha. Did you uh, run a check on that name, Lynn Peters? Uh, like a darn fool, right after I locked you in here last night. Nothing, huh? Nothing. Nothing? Hey. What? Look, here she is. I knew I'd find her. I knew it, Randy. And look, look. Her name is Ruth Balachet. Oh, I thought you said her name was Lynn Peters. Did I say it was her right name? Okay, okay. So it's Ruth Valachet, the quick dip. The what? You know her? Sure, the quick dip we called her. Purse snatcher, pickpocket, years ago. All right, then. But not anymore, Johnny. So don't you make any trouble with her. Ruth's clean these days. She is, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see. And the address? Yeah. 21... 21- 
20, West 94. Charlie, forget your key. Oh, Charlie Dollar. Mm-hmm. Hi, Lynn, or is it really Ruth? Ruth? Lynn? Aren't you making some mistake? Well, I don't say you don't recognize me this time. I've never seen you before in my life. Who are you and what do you want? Are you kidding? I am not. Who is it you wish to see? My cute little seatmate on the plane down from Hartford yesterday. You. Me? And don't try to tell me you're not the one. The one who gave me the name of Lynn Peters, only it's really Ruth Valache. I'm sorry, mister. I never heard of either of them. Now, if you'll take your foot out of the door. Now, just a minute. What is this? Some kind of a racket. Well, if you don't think I can scream loud enough for that cop in the corner Will you hear listen me? to me for a minute? No. She'd use that name again. The same one Mrs. Weatherwell had used. Charlie. Charles. So maybe he was the key to all this. The rest of the day, I watched the place, hoping he'd appear. Nothing. Nor the next day. Or the next. Then it hit me. Item three, $1.20 for a call to Les in Hartford. Where you been, Johnny? I, I tried to call you at your apartment half a dozen times. Just answer my question, Les. Uh, Mrs. Weatherwell's beneficiaries? Yes. Only one. Her stepson, son of the man who died, left her a widow. What's his name? And incidentally, the insurance is payable immediately on formal notice of her death. Half a million worth. All right, Les. What's his name? Uh, Charles. Charles Weatherwell. Do you know where I can find him? Well, somewhere in New York, I believe. But but don't worry, Johnny. Yeah? From what she's told me, 15 minutes after word of her death gets out, he'll be pounding on my door demanding the insurance. She hates him. Then why leave him the insurance? Oh, only member of the family still left, that sort of thing. Look, Les. And it doesn't look as though he'll have long to wait. What do you mean? Well, like I say, I tried to call you. No answer. So I called the Weatherwell place. A uh, uh, doctor answered. Oh? Told me that two weeks ago she was healthy as all get out. But now she's about ready to kick off. From what? Well, the doctor and a couple of other specialists can't figure it out. Some strange kind of anemia, maybe. Only it's come on so darn fast that... Well, they, they, they just don't know. Then maybe Charlie does. What? Thanks, Les. <laughs> Okay, now, Lynn. No, just a minute. Oh, you again. That's right. What do you want around here, mister? A little information. You with that ridiculous talk about a, a plane from Hartford. Where is he? Charlie Weatherwell. Charlie? Right here. Follow on. Don't, don't shoot him, Charlie. Don't. Don't worry. But here, you keep the gun on him just in case. Sure. See, though? Told you he'd be back. Did you fix a hypo for him? Right here, baby. One shot of this and you'll be out for at least five days. Now pull up his sleeve. Sure. It it won't kill him, will it? No, it won't kill him. I didn't study chemistry for nothing. Already, then. Here now. Intramuscular. So the effect will be slow and will last. There. And by the time he comes out of this, you and I'll have the insurance and the ruby and be on the other side of the Atlantic. Now, let's get out of here. <laughs> hit from behind, when you don't know if the punk who did it has a gun, it's smart to play possum. The only thing that worried me was that injection in the muscle of my left arm. The minute they left, I sterilized the blade of my pocket knife with a match, made a deep cross cut through the needle mark, and squeezed until my fingers were sore. It must have done the trick. Although I felt giddy for a while, I didn't pass out. Item four, two bucks at a nearby saloon for a slug of brandy. Item five, twenty dollars for some work on the arm by a doctor who stopped asking questions only after I showed him my credentials. Then I drove back to Bronxville. Uh, yes? Who are you? Dr. Harmon Barley, and you, sir? Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, yes, Dollar, I've heard of you. Um, come in. 
How is she, Doctor? She's still alive? Yes, but in spite of all we're doing for her, she is... Well, maybe you're doing wrong. Beg your pardon? Where is she? Upstairs. I've called in a couple of specialists for consultation. Just tell me this. Is she wearing the necklace with the ruby pendant? An almost orange-colored ruby that was stolen temporarily? Yes, she is, but why? Then come on. Get out of the country with not only the insurance, but the ruby, Charlie said. Charlie? Ruby? Yes, that means he made a substitute for the real one after he stole it from her, before he got the stuff back to her via the girlfriend. Mr. Dollar, just... Which way now? Uh, uh, second door on the right. All right, come on. sort of mark on her chest, where the so-called ruby in that pendant rested was the only sign. But it was enough to convince the two specialists. They immediately began treatment for one of the most subtle and fiendish poisons known to man. Then, some 36 hours later, after she'd passed the crisis... Yes, Mr. Dollar, that cantankerous old patient of mine. Well, I patient must... Patient of ours now, Dr. Briley. I stand corrected, Dr. Radford. And that goes for Dr. Wilson, too. Anyhow, she's going to be all right. Good. Now that we have a breather, Mr. Dollar, tell us. Yes? What in the world ever led you to believe that this uh, sudden, almost violent deterioration of the red corpuscles in her blood was, was caused by potassium paradigramate? Doctor, a couple of months ago... In one of our western states, a young student made up some jewelry out of various crystals that he'd put together in the laboratory. It was written up in the press. Oh, yes, yes, I remember that. Uh, so do I. Not to mention it, but uh, there was uh, quite a furor over the fact that uh, some of the crystals that looked so like jewels were, were actually deadly poison. Yes, and that contact with human tissue for any length of time... Yes, yes, very, uh, uh, the very symptoms that Mrs. Weatherwell was baffling us with until you... That's came. right. So, when I heard him say that he had the ruby... He? The one who did this? Yes, when he said he had the ruby, and that meant the real one, I figured he must have substituted one of these deadly crystals in the pendant on her necklace. And you were right. But wait, you know the name of this man? I certainly do. Dr. Brearley was right. The cantankerous old biddy's recovery was complete. Though I must admit, a little short of miraculous. I went back to my apartment, made a call to Les Walters, got a few hours of badly needed sleep, then the next morning joined Les at his office. Oh, yes, Johnny, it took a little uh, finagling, but the item appeared in this morning's Hartford Current. Oh, the uh, New York papers got it, too. Good, good, Les. So the word is out that Mrs. Gurney Dalrymple Weatherwell has died. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tomorrow, of course, there'll be a retraction. Of course. Oh, where is he, Les? I thought you said that 15 minutes after the news got out, we... Oh, Johnny. <laughs> he, he has to have time to get here, so... Oh, I'd say that he ought to appear... But, uh... Uh, yes, Miss Mandeville? Uh, Mr. Weatherwell is here, Mr. Walters. Oh? <laughs> Send him in. Right on cue, do you suppose? <laughs> Mr. Walters, my name is Charles Weatherwell. I'm beneficiary of my stepmother's insurance, and as I understand, it's to be paid to me immediately and with a... With a... Hmm? Yes, Mr. Weatherwell, meet um, Johnny Dollar. Oh, uh, we've met. Hi, Charlie. What's the matter? Uh... How do you get here? What is this? Some kind of trick? Oh, and before I forget it, Mr. Weatherall, there was a call for you a couple of minutes ago. Call? For uh, me? Yes. Your stepmother. Want to return it? Here, you can use this phone. No. No, she's dead. Oh, you saw that erroneous news report. No. It's true. It has to be. Why? Because you poisoned her? What? No. Of course not. You mean yes, don't you? It's a trick. It's a trick. Charlie. But you won't get away with it. Put that gun away. No. I'll kill you, too. Not today, Charlie. <laughs> all right. All right, all right. It's okay. It's, it's all okay, folks. Everything's under control. Just a little argument in here, and 
<laughs> Mr. Dollar has settled it. Quite satisfactorily. <laughs> Peters, nay Ruth Valachet, had made the mistake of waiting for Charlie outside in a car. So, she'll have her day in court, too. Oh, and the original ruby, the real one, we found sewed into the lining of Charlie's coat. Expense account total? Well, just for kicks, why don't we call it a hundred bucks? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, I want all of you to be sure and listen. You may be sorry if you miss it. I call it the case of the tip-off matter. So tune in, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If you drive a car, remember this. Almost anywhere in the country where you see the Sinclair sign, you can save up to four cents a gallon on gasoline by using Sinclair Dino. That's because in three out of five cars, regular priced Sinclair Dino matches the performance of expensive premium gasolines, costing up to four cents more a gallon. Drive with care and buy Sinclair Dino gasoline. <laughs> Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Carl Frank, Olive Deering, Elspeth Eric, Sam Gray, Casey Allen, Dean Carlton, and Rene Santoni. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. Technical supervision by Larry Solon. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hanna speaking. September 23rd, 1962, 61 years ago today, the next to the last episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thanks to Ted from RadioMemories.com for getting me such a good copy of that show and for the upcoming edition of Lum and Abner that you will hear in just a moment from 69 years ago, September 23rd, 1935. That's up in a moment. Okay, Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now, as I mentioned, from 88 years ago, September 23rd, 1935, Lum and Abner, thanks to Ted at RadioMemories.com for this very good quality episode. down to Pine Ridge for another visit with Lum and Abner, brought to you by the makers of Horlicks, the original malted milk. Many of you I know are familiar with Horlicks, but don't know the many uses this famous product has. How many of you know, for instance, that Horlicks makes a welcome change for breakfast, in place of coffee, tea, or milk, I mean, or that youngsters love the dry malted milk sprinkled on their cereal, like sugar? Or that Hor Horlicks makes a fine, easily digested luncheon, one that thousands use to keep themselves alert all afternoon. You see what I mean? There are scores of uses for this delicious malted milk. Every day we get many letters from users of Horlicks telling us new ways to enjoy it. The writers of these letters range from youngsters who love to drink this children's favorite, all the way to old folks who never miss taking a glass of Horlicks last thing at night to help them get sound, refreshing sleep, and to prevent night hunger. If you haven't had any Horlicks recently, 
Get a package from your dealer in either natural or chocolate flavor. And now, let's see what's happening down in Pine Ridge. After Lum sold off all his personal property and mortgaged his farm and home for enough to pay off all the stockholders in the silver mine in hopes of clearing himself of the charge of violating the blue sky law, he learned Friday that his efforts were all in vain. He was advised that by paying off the investors, he only made the evidence point stronger than ever to his guilt. His only hope for acquittal now rests in locating Squire Skimp, who promoted the company, and return him to Pine Ridge in time for the trial. As we look in on Pine Ridge today, we find Lum over at his home. Habner's been out on their rolling grocery store all morning and is at the door. Listen. Come in, come in. Oh, come in, Abner. I, I didn't know where I'd set you home or not, Lum. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. How was business today? Oh, pretty good. There's some stuff we're out of. We're needing off a bad door. I got it wrote down here. I brought it over to you. Yeah. Well, I can call up the wholesale house and get it out here first thing in the morning. Let's see the list. Yeah, yeah. Know it. I got it here somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it is. Yeah, that's that's it. Mm -hmm. What's this item here? Toters. To oh, taters. That's an A there. Taters. Taters. <laughs> potatoes. Yeah, taters. Eating taters. Yeah. Better get a couple of sacks of them, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. We've been running out a lot here late. What's this? Rice. R I S E. Rice. Yeah, we're plumb out of rice, Lom. Rice. <laughs> huh? Sit spelling. Look at this. Flour. F L O U R. <laughs> you mean flour to bake bread with? Yeah, like eating flour. For yeah. goodness sake. F L O W E R. Well, I never thought that looked right. I figured they'd made a mistake. Figured who'd made a mistake? Why, whoever it was that put that printing on the sack, I copied it off the sack. Oh, you, you copied it down off of the sack? Huh? Yeah, yeah, just rub that out there and change it, Mom. No, that's all right. Just let it go. No, go ahead and change it. I don't want nobody to see it if I spell it wrong. I said we just let it go. I can recollect what it is. F-L-O-U-R. Yeah, it's a new one on me. <laughs> huh? Nothing, nothing. Uh, this next item here you got down here is S-P-I-N-I-T-C-H. Oh, spinach, yeah. Yeah, that ain't it. Er, did you copy that off of the can? No, no, we was out of that. I couldn't find it. I never it. thought that looked right. You spell that S-P-I-N spinach. Spin it. I guess that's right. Yeah, did, did I put down lard on that list there, Lon? Lard? Yeah. I reckon I ain't put one more item here, and it's, uh... Well, I reckon I must have forgot it. You better put down a case of that for we're smack dab out of it. Wait a minute. What is this other item here? G-R-E-S-E. -E. Oh, well, that's it. Grease. Lard. Lard. One, two, goodness. You ought to be sent back to school, Abner. Next time you need stuff, just drive the store by here, and I'll come out there in front and make out the list myself. Yeah. Uh, are you through there now? Through? Yeah, I got something else here for you, too. Something else for me? Yeah. <laughs> I brought a book over for you. Well, much obliged to you. That's mighty thorough. Well, you. It, it ain't a present, Lom. I just brought it over for you to read. Oh. Yeah. Much obliged. How to become a great detective. Yeah, don't you know I ordered that for myself when I was first elected constable. Oh, yeah. I thought I recollect seeing this thing before summer. I, I figured maybe you'd like to read up on it, uh, how to disguise yourself, you know, to where folks won't know you. Disguise myself up to where folks won't know me. Yeah, dress yourself up like an Indian chief and wear big whiskers and stuff like that. I know what disguising is, but what would I want to do it for? Well, you want to catch Squire Skimp, don't you? Why, well, sure, but I don't Well, that's the way detectives does, love them. They disguise themselves up to where nobody won't know them, and then they can slip up on them and catch them. Well, that's what the book says. Or that's what it's got wrote in it. Well, it ain't going to help none for me to disguise myself. Well, now, I think you're the one that's supposed to wear it. You or Squire One. No, oh, it's you, Lum. I, I know that's what it says. Or read. For see, if Squire wants to dress up like the Indian, why, you wouldn't know him, see? And you're the one that's trying to catch him. I him. know, I know, Abner. But if Squire ain't in town, it ain't going to do no good to go around in no disguise looking like an Indian. Well, of course, there's lots of other things you could be besides the Indian. I just happen to think of that. You could dress up like Santa Claus. That foolish. <laughs> He wouldn't be looking for him.
specialist time of year. No, nobody else would, neither. No, that's what I say. You could fool everybody. You can get some of the craziest ideas in your head i ever seen. Well, let's see. i tell you what'd be a good one, Mom. Get yourself a bear outfit. Bear outfit? Yeah. What kind of a get up that? Why make yourself look like a bear? Oh, for goodness sake. You can get that bear skin rug from Uncle Henry Lunchford. Don't you recollect he won first prize at the masquerade party in it one time? Yeah, I'd look fine running around town here dressed up like a bear. Well, I <laughs> bet you nobody wouldn't know it was you. Yeah, and somebody about take a shot at me with a load of buckshot, too. Make that bear skin look like a seal. Oh, well, I don't think Uncle Henry'd mind. They don't use it no way long. Oh, but what about me? I'd be on the inside of it. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Of course, we could tell everybody not to shoot at you. Not to shoot at? Yeah, trouble with that, though. They'd know who it was, wouldn't it? Well, let's see now. I'm about to find me up a tree somewhere with a pack of hounds sitting around trying to get at me. Well, I don't believe the bear eye is any count no way, Lom. I know Squire Skimp ain't going to just stand still and let no bear walk up and catch him. Well, of course not. No. That's the craziest idea I ever heard. Well, uh, let's look through that book. Maybe we can find one you like better there. Abner, I don't want to disguise myself. I well, told now, you Well, now, wait a do... minute now. Now, let me show you something here. It tells all about... Here, here. Uh, no, that ain't it. It's got a picture of a fella showing up. Uh... Yeah, yeah, here it is. Yeah, look there. See, here, here he is before he put on a disguise, and then right over here on this other page is him after he put on them whiskers and stuff. <laughs> I noticed you never would know it was him in that second picture, would you? Mm, I never even knowed him in the first picture. Never seen him before. He could have just stayed like he was, and I wouldn't have known him. Why, of course not. He's crazy. Now, here, here he is dressed up like a soldier. Did anybody know that was a soldier, though? Tell by the uniform. Oh, well, sure. Well, it says here... Detective Callahan was very successful as an American spy during the World War. He is pictured here disguised as a German soldier. Hmm. Well, uh, whose side was he on? Yeah, according to this, he was with the Americans, but he dressed himself like a German. Well, that's the foolishest thing I ever heard of. Run around with the Americans and dressed up like a German. Oh, well, he was over in the trenches with a German soldier, though. So. Oh, I thought you said he's with the Americans. Well, he was. He was with the Americans, but he's with the Germans. Oh, for goodness sakes, Abner. I'll huh? He was hired by the Americans, but fought with the Germans. You mean the Americans had to hire soldiers for the other side? No, no. He was what they called a spy. He was working for the Americans, but fought for the Germans. Well, I'll be dead blamed. Now, that's appreciation for you. Us a harn him, him over there fighting for them. Well, that's what they wanted him to do. They wanted him to? He was finding out the Germans' plans and sending them back to our side. We couldn't have got along tall without fellas like him. Well, we did do it. We win, and he was on the other side. All right, all right. Just let it go. Put the book up. Yeah. I ain't got time to explain it Well, to let you. me just show you this. Just put the book up, I said. Wouldn't do go no good to dress up in no disguise, no way. Squire ain't here in Pine Ridge. First thing I've got to do is find out where he's at before I try to catch him. I might could dress up like something. You dress up? Yeah, I could drive backwards and forwards in front of his house in the store, and, and if Squire come out to buy something, well, I could catch him before he knows... He ain't over at his house. Ain't even in town, I told you. I was over talking to Miss Kemp this morning. She ain't got no more ideas where he's at than we have. Well, I'm just trying to help you. I know you are, Abner, and I appreciate it, too. You know what like that it. judge said? The only way for you to keep out of the penitentiary is find Squire Skim. I know it, I know it. I'm doing everything I can to locate him. Got to find him first, though. Yeah. I had an idea here this morning. It might have. Going to put some advertisements in the paper for him. Advertisement? Yeah, I wrote out two or three here I thought I might use. Figured I might scatter them around over the country in newspapers. Uh huh. Giving a description of him and all. Oh, one of them lost, strayed, or stole things, huh? Well, sort of, not exactly. Just telling what he looks like and offering a reward for information about where he's at and all. Yeah. Yeah, I done that once when my mule strayed off. I got them back all right, but. I don't know where to work on humans or not. Well, I just figured, though, about the only chance we had was to... Wait a minute. Come in, come in. Yeah, yeah, howdy, Dick. Come in, Dick, come in. Yeah, Mom, I've got some good news for you. Good news? Yeah, I want to show you something here. Look at what came in the mail a while ago. Well, nice of you to bring it over, Dick. I could have come down and... Wait a minute. <laughs> it is the wrong letter. This ain't for me, Dick. This is for me, Skim. Yeah, but look at that return address on the envelope, Bob. Huh? 
Look there in the corner. Oh. After five days, return to M.K. Skimp in care of General Delivery, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, I'll be dead blame that squire. Sure it is. And he's in Tulsa. <laughs> Granny's, I know we'd locate him, will you? Well, if Square is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, maybe Abner's detective book will come in handy after all. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the phone in the home of Mrs. Grace Stockton. We're just about to hear a mighty interesting conversation. Listen. Hello? Who? Oh, hello, Jane. I didn't know your voice. Yes, I'm going to be in for a little while anyway. You've got what? A new way to reduce? Yes, I'd love to hear about it. Sure, come right on over. I'll be waiting. Yes, and goodbye. And now, the scene is in Grace's home a few minutes later. Jane, Grace's friend, is telling her about her new reducing plan. Listen. Anything more, Jane? No, that's all there is to it. Just cut out those heavy lunches we've been eating and drink a glass of Horlicks instead. None of those awful exercises, nothing to take, either. Well, that sounds all right, Jane. I often drink Horlicks, but, uh, but I... There are no buts, Grace. You know Mrs. Green and that crowd. Well, they've been using Horlicks for two weeks, and they've lost quite a few pounds already. That's good enough for me. But, Jane, let me ask you one question. Is this plan safe? I mean, cutting down on meals isn't always a good thing to do, you know. I don't want to interrupt, ladies and gentlemen, but I think I can answer that question even better than Jane. The Horlick plan is essentially safe, because Horlicks is a nourishing, sustaining food. It contains the elements necessary for proper energy and nourishment, and a glass full every noon gives ample strength and sustenance to carry on. You can safely try this plan. Your doctor will most certainly approve it. You can get Horlicks, you know, in both natural and chocolate flavor. Remember, just drink a glass full every day in place of your regular noonday lunch. That's all there is to it. This is Carlton Bricker, speaking for Lum and Abner and Horlicks. We'll now bid you all goodbye until tomorrow at the same time. like Dick Huddleston's a better detective than either Lum or Abner. Uh, this episode of Lum and Abner goes back to September 23rd, 1935, 88 years ago today. And again, thanks to Ted at RadioMemories.com. He supplies shows on cassette, CD, or flash drive for your computer. Beautifully restored, RadioMemories.com. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Wyatt Cox. My webpage is classicradio.stream, and uh, we appreciate your support of the podcast. We'll be back with another one uh, on Sunday. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox.